Hello? <coughs> I see some people are still discussing. Um, so my topic today is multiphase flows applications. And I decided to go for a very um, kind of like hands-on approach with lots of um, ex um, examples from my experiments in the lab. Um, and uh, so my, my field is granular materials. Um, and I'm doing a little bit of particle laden flows. And today I'll be focusing on some novel approaches that we've been taking to uh, obtain data from, from um, previously hidden features. Um, so I will start this presentation with identifying some challenges that I think exist that limit our understanding of uh, modeling granular flows. And then I'll give two examples of how we um, um, try to get further and kind of get a step forward. So before we get into the depth, um, I just want to give you a kind of broad overview of things where we encounter granular or particulate material. So here we have um, some medicine. So if you have the, the, um, the pressing of, of pills and medication, obviously if you have a batch process, you want to have in every individual um, particle the same ingredients. And if you have uh, processes like segregation, the risk is, of course, that um, during the process, the ingredients separate and you get um, um, two different um, constituents in, in different pills. Another example here is uh, large industrial processes, and we have another example here. So if you have large bulk material that you either want to store or transport, there are additional concerns. So for example, in big silos, if you excavate the silo, you get silo honking and potentially um, um, failure of the structure. And in the last example, if you have large um, particle flows um, and they try to store it, there was an, an example last year, I think, in Germany where they had large um, coal mountains and, and some uh, locally fac local factory workers um, got buried in one of the avalanches and I don't think it, it ended up well. Um, so here are some geophysical processes. And this is a, just a, a sand dune, and sometimes it's hard to see the scale, but this is 100 meters, so this is half a kilometer across. And these are individual dunes in Qatar, where I've done some field work. And these dunes are just marching along. The wind is going from bottom to top. But when these sand dunes kind of stay in a, in a, a fixed location for a long time, they can actually form sandstone. And that's an example here, where we see these, these strata and these layers. This is sandstone in Arizona. And what you can see here is these, these layers, which were actually formed by, by aeolian process of wind-blown sand, kind of depositing and avalanching down. And later on, it turned into rock. And this is very important for uh, oil and gas companies, because often in these type of, of um, uh, sedimentary rock, there, th there is um, uh, oil reserves that are captured. So one important question is, of course, how do you get the, the oil and gas out? And how does uh, water penetrate in these type of layers? It's not going straight down. Another example, which Jim already discussed quite a lot, is snow avalanches. So here you see just a deposit. And what you can see here is there is a very clear discrepancy in particle size. So you have small particles in the middle, large particles on the side and the front. And that really um, impacts the uh, flowability of these um, um, mass flows, which we'll see later. So thinking about the grand challenges, um, in experimental uh, granular materials, particle-laden flows, and actually this is a point that came up in, in yesterday already in a completely different um, um, topic in this conference, but one important component is that you have small particles that you um, try to model in a larger system, like dunes, avalanches. So there's this particle-to-system scale crossover. And if you have point data, how do you get, get it uh, superimposed to a large data file? or a, a, a large system. Another example, uh, or a, another grand challenge, I think, is repeatability. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And a third one is limited data that you can only sample. There's always, when you do experiments, there's only a limited amount of data that you can access. Um, so the second and third part of my talk will focus on two specific examples from laboratory experiments. One in which we look at um, a new method um, to use, an so we use photoelasticity to look at avalanches, which really gives us a new class of data from um, moving particle flows. And this uh, third topic is uh, 
some work we've been doing on dune migration. And this is actually giving more the system perspective. So here we're making a crossover of, of a grain perspective, a particle perspective. And this is actually, you're losing the information of the individual particles, but you're looking at the behavior of a collective of particles. So that's the, the structure of my talk, but we'll start with the grand challenges. So before we continue, most of the people in the audience, I think, are experienced in fluid dynamics. So what's different when you have particles? Well, in fluid dynamics, there are two different uh, changes. So in a granular material, the main question is, how does it flow uh, under stress? And the stress-strain relationship is not straightforward. And the big difference is that you have a flow threshold. If you have a, a bucket of, of water, you let it go, and it just spreads out. In granular material, there's a threshold, so you can get a little heap, and it will not just, you know, it has some rigidity, so it will not flow out. You have this uh, resistance, and you have an angle of repose that that's being created. So this angle of repose is basically an, um, a minimum angle before everything starts to go. And the second difference is the shear rate dependency. So um, the inertia actually uh, depends on the shear rate, and there can be some stiffening or some non-Newtonian effects in, in granular materials, and that's another um, important difference. So the central um, uh, goal is usually to find a proper constitutive law for granular materials where you combine the, sorry, the shear stress with the pressure, and modeling this, this stress ratio or um, mu is, is a, a key open question, and there a moment ago, the mu of rheology was mentioned. That's an, an, um, an approach that has been around for about 15 years. Uh, in the last five years, there's a new branch of research which tried to circumvent the problems that are around with mu of rheology. So another issue is the packing fraction, which obviously can change as well. If you can compress a granular material, it becomes denser. So this can be a, a function of external parameters. And the uh, non-dimensional number that's important here is the inertial number which is uh, basically linking the some time scale involving with the particle with linking uh, a time scale with the flow. So let me just, the dry areas. So in this first grand challenge, where we are kind of crossing off from particle to system, we have this interesting uh, question. We have this, this, this discrete solid particles of different properties. Um, they have um, if they collide, you can imagine that they deform a little bit, that the formation depends on the properties. But then if you look at a general flow, like an avalanche, which is composed of millions of these particles, uh, how can you come up with a continuum approach with macroscale properties? And that connection is very difficult. Um, and my big summary of that is that constitutive relations for all scales and phases do not exist. So we, we have a good understanding of kind of like a billiard ball interaction between different particles. We have some flow models for larger scale processes, but how does this connection between the two scales happen? And also another example is the phase. So how this is um, kind of a snow avalanche that, that acts more as a fluid. These are blocks of snow that move as a solid. And if there's a lot of inertia involved, then it's more like a gas. So. That's the other complicating thing. If you have this granular material, what kind of phase are you able to describe um, or cover? The mo um, if you have a model of a granular material, what kind of phases does it uh, cover? So another um, problem is the repeatability. And a good experimentalist will know that if you go to the lab and you do an experiment, you use a set of initial conditions, you do the experiment, and when you come back the next day and you choose the same initial conditions, you want to have the same outcome. Um, <laughs> and you could explore a little bit of variability, kind of like measurement error, but what you don't want to happen is that you get a completely different outcome. And that's really difficult if you're looking at granular materials, because even if you're doing simply two um, sizes of particles, which are very, very kind of like um, well-defined in size, if you just pour the material in a bucket, it will already start to segregate. And segregate is can be due to the density, shape, or size. Um, it needs some kind of action. But as a result, you get the separation of particles in, in preferred bands. Um, and you get non-uniformities, which uh, can really mess up your experiments. And I just have an example here, which 
shows that repeatability is not assured, even if you're a good uh, experimental researcher. Um, and here's an example. We have a kilogram of white bellatini, which we are avalanching down a slope. So we have a slope of two meters. We're releasing one kilogram of particles at the top, and we're looking at how this um, avalanche kind of spreads out. And the angle is such that 25 degrees, so it, it flows, but because of the, the, roughness of the roughness of the base, the material, t material decelerates and it comes to a stop. So this is the final deposit. And this work was done by uh, one of my master students, Elsa. But you do three experiments, three realizations, and if you look at general properties like run-out length or thickness of the avalanche, it comes out as three fairly you know, similar experiments. So that's good. Check mark. Now we're doing, uh, now we're changing a parameter. We're changing the particle size from about half a millimeter uh, to one millimeter. And for visualization, these particles are red. So the first thing that you notice is that the particles don't flow that far. And that's because the base didn't change. So the frictional interaction between the particles and the base is slightly different. But we we're doing the experiment three times and you get a very nicely outcome. It's again, similar run out ratio. So now we're taking half a kilogram of these one millimeter particles and we're taking half a kilogram of these um, half a millimeter particles and we're mixing them up. And when I say mix them up, I really mean it very properly. Um, of course, one could stir, one could shake, but that all segregates. So we layered it in very, very tiny layers just to get the best mixing possible. And what you get here is three different realizations <laughs> and three very different outcomes. So first of all, you can see that both or all three avalanches flow further, but because of segregation, you get this channelization. So you get small particles are in the middle, large particles rise up and are expunged to the sides and the front. But because of the fact that um, the individual particles like the individual properties of the particles are perhaps slightly to the left or to the right in your initial setting, you get three different outcomes. And this is done under highly controlled experimental conditions. So this kind of shows the difficulty if you're trying to explore granular materials in experiments, especially when you're starting to change properties. Um, a third example, which I think is uh, one of the grand challenges, is limited data. And this is true for everything. On the, on the right here in the taxi, I was talking with someone doing um, rogue waves. I can't see the person right now in the audience. There you go. Rogue waves. And we were talking about a completely different s field of science. But in that case, you either have point data, so you only know properties at one location very well, or you have general limited data. Um, and that's true for granular materials as well. Now, I'll show that um, with a few examples. And one cause of that is opaqueness of the particles. So because of the opaqueness, you can't see through, you get very easily surface data. So you can look at a you know, video on an avalanche, look at the surface data, you get velocity, position, um, but the internal data underneath the avalanche is hidden because the material is opaque. And the other shortcoming is that you don't have any access to stresses and forces. You don't know what the stresses and forces are. And I just have one example here of some work we've done in the lab on granular fingering and I forgot to put the acknowledgement, this was work by Alexander Johnson, an undergraduate. Um, and again, we did layering, um, and we released a mixture down a slope again, but this time, it was not only the size that was different, but also the roughness. So we used Bellatini, which is very smooth and small, and we have safety grid, which is large and rough. And again, we had a rough base. So this is an example of how we get um, kinetic data, this is looking straight at it. We get the avalanche coming down. You see the two different sizes of particles. The flow slows down. You see the black particles are rough. They go to the front, but they stop because they have a higher friction with the base. And then you get these finger formations. And this is an experiment that you can just take high-speed data on. But now if you're <coughs> doing post-processing and you get some surface data from PIV, you get some really interesting data. So you see the front, it stops. Then you get an, a wave going back, you get fingers progressing forward. The entire flow stops here. So the, the color is the, the downstream velocity. It really slows down and it's just the fingers that propagate further. So we get some really interesting results from here, 
But the limitation is it's just surface velocity. We don't know what's going on, on the underneath, and we don't know what the stresses in the, in the forces are. So if you want to do proper um, uh, modeling of a granular material, you do need to have access to some data where you can base your rheological model on. So there are some uh, alternatives. Um, there are several people doing work on different um, topics. So there's, for example, refractive index matched um, uh, experimentation. This is a, a file from Casper van der Vaart, um, who did some work with Christophe van C in EPFL. Um, they used that by dispersed um, granular avalanches on a conveyor belt. The thing is, they immersed it in a fluid, an index matched fluid. And by shining a laser sheet through the middle, they were able to get some really nice internal data. So the, the conveyor belt is moving up, the avalanche is moving down, and you see large particles congregating in the front. But if you look carefully, sometimes the particles go out of plane. So these particles sometimes become smaller and larger. That's not because they lose or win mass. It's really they're out of plane. So you can get really interesting data from this, but it's limited to a plane, and you need to add fluid, which fundamentally changes the, the collisions and the rheology. So if you're interested in just dry granular flows, there's not so much you can do th 3D. Another option is X-ray tomography, but the problem there is that you have quasi-steady um, um, geometries or quasi-steady processes. So you can take a snapshot, 3D, all the way through, and then you change something, and then you take another snapshot all the way through. But if you're interested in, in dynamic processes, avalanches or some other fast-moving flows, this doesn't work. Another possibility is positron emission particle tracking. Um, I've done once an, an exploratory experiment in Birmingham with this technique. It's, it's very time intensive. You get 3D information and you get it on dynamic flows, but you have one radioactive particle that you're inserting in the flow and you're tracking that particle. So first of all, you want to have some kind of rotating or repeating experiment because you want to get statistically significant data and you need to get a lot of data before you're able to explore the entire geometry. So that's another like uh, complication. And all of them only give you the kinetics. There's no information on forces and stresses, which would be really lovely if we would get that from experiments. So those are a quick summary of my three grand challenges in experimentation in, in um, granular materials. And I now want to focus on two topics from some laboratory experiments that we've done to get a little bit further in this field and get some new data. And the first one is um, to look at the grain perspective, so the really the particle-particle interaction. And we're using photoelasticity to reveal some full particle-particle interaction. And um, this technique has been around, it was made big by Bob Beringer, who sadly passed away last year. But um, he did a lot of work over the past 15, 20 years on photoelasticity. Uh, the principle is that you have a change of refractive index when stressed. So if you have a particle, um, there's one in my bag, I forgot to gr grab it, get it out. These particles are about a centimeter, discs. If you stress them, they change their optical properties. And if you illuminate them in the proper way, you get a response. And you can actually get a quantitative response. So there's a calibration between the pattern and the stress. So here we're pressing one particle and you see these force chains moving in a triangle down. And the harder you press, the higher the force. And this is a unique calibration, one-on-one. -on -one. And this work is uh, together with my PhD student, Amalia Thomas, um, who's showing off her, her outreach award that she got from the university last year. Um, she's, she's doing some fantastic work. It's also a collaboration with, uh, we got some techniques from Jon Jonathan Barris, uh, the photoelastic disk solver that we're using is um, developed by Jonathan Colmer, and we're collaborating for some of the uh, aspects with Karen Daniels. So the novelty of this is to use photoelasticity, which has been around for a while, in a dynamic avalanche. So previous work was done on a box of photoelastic particles. We're slowly either shearing it or compressing it, and then you get a slow response. We're actually chucking down a lot of these particles down a chute, and we're looking at instantaneous interactions. And another uh, complication there is that the interactions we're looking at are occurring across milliseconds. So we really need um, a fast acquisition uh, apparatus, 
and there's no force equilibrium. So you can't say that there's a perfect, uh, because the particles move. So you can't get force equilibrium. And that makes the post-processing harder. And the other thing that we um, kind of improved on was that we're, we're casting these particles, and therefore the these particles are super high quality. We can give them any shape we want, and there are no residual stresses. So it's another um, um, kind of improvement we made. So the goal of this mo project, this general project, is to measure any um, local, non local rheology in intermediate flows, so fast flows. <coughs> so in photoelasticity, you use cross polarizers, um, and those cross polarizers are able to illuminate the um, the phase difference that being that's being created by the load. Um, so you have cross polarizers here. You have your your experimental cell here, and um, the the phase difference that's being created, the re retardation, is uh, a direct function of um, the amount of load that you're in, in applying on it. So you get an experimental fringe distribution. We get an uh, we model a theoretical pressure distribution from which we get a theoretical fringe distribution. And then we're trying to limit the error between <coughs> these two. And the um, the two principal stresses create an intensity of light, and it's a direct um, calibration between the two. So this is our experiment. This is Amalia, and um, we are loading this hopper with about 5,000 to 6,000 uh, photoelastic particles. In a moment, she'll pull this slide. These particles will run down this two-meter-long uh, incline, and uh, we have a light box here with these polarizing films, and that's where we are able to measure um, the photoelastic response. So you can't see anything here yet, but this is how, how it's, how it's uh, flowing down. We get the significant uh, thickness of this avalanche, and we can uh, create any um, basal roughness there. So if you look at the high-speed camera input, this is the front of the avalanche. And is there a way to turn off the lights here? OK. So if you look carefully, you can see these particles flowing down. And you see these lightning flashes, these kind of like bolts of lightning that get on and get off. And um, they are... Um, if you look carefully, there's a certain trend to it. So I'll 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 quantify it later on. But there's a certain trend to this um, uh, to these uh, bolts. And um, what we can do is look at this this video and do a time series at a given position. Um, so what you see initially is an an avalanche that builds up. And then we have a steady state flow, and towards the end, as the hopper depletes, then the flow kind of weans out. The f the our shoot is inclined at 20 degrees, and um, we have measurements at different points from the inlet, but in this case I'm only uh, presenting results from just below the inlet. So, a di disclaimer, because there are some limitations. So first of all, as some of you may already guessed, this is a two-dimensional technique. We really have a monolayer of particles, so we don't have multiple particles in width. It's just a monolayer. Um, so we can't represent any 3D lateral effects. We were looking at granular fingering a moment ago, where particles rise up and are expunged to the side. We can't mimic that. And we have tried 3D uh, photoelastic material, um, but the signal that we get is just not unique, so we don't get a unique outcome. But it does feature depth profiles and segregation in depth, so we, ca we can get C dependencies of important flow uh, features. Another limitation is that um, we are working with the detection limit of the, of the methods. So we are able to pick up forces which are bigger than 0 0.01 Newton, which is fine. It just breaks down at the upper, upper region where the hydrostatic pressure is not very high. In the upper region of the flow, we're not able to pick up these photoelastic responses. Um, and another point that you may wonder is, OK, we have these particles, and that's point data that you get. So how do you get? continuum profiles or fields. So what we do is a technique which is used a lot in, in discrete modeling, discrete particle modeling. Uh, we're using coarse graining to get from particle data with sufficient length of time to acquire a lot of statistically significant data. 
we obtain um, continuum data, quantitative co uh, continuum data from coarse graining. So let's look at two examples, a uh, smooth base and a rough base, so two different boundary conditions at the bottom. So let's first um, look at the coarse graining. So we have point data. Um, we're coarse graining over a certain uh, length scale W, and the implication of W is that if you choose it too narrow, it's really just a point, so you still have a kind of a speckled pattern of point data. If you choose W too wide or too large, then you have kind of a constant field. So you want to get the perfect um, like measure in the, in the middle, where you have kind of evolution of, of parameters, but that is not point-based. And <coughs> there's a certain technique on, on how you can um, pick this independently. And then we apply this to density, momentum, and velocity profiles. Um, and from that, we can get um, kinetic data, uh, velocities, accelerations, and densities. So let's first look at the density. We have two different base basal conditions, smooth and rough base. And what you get is a, there's first of all a little bit of a wiggle here. And this is because the particles start to form layers as they avalanche down. So there's a, a layer dependency. And even though we use 10% degree, uh, 10 of size differences in the particles that we're using, there's still some layers, which have been found in other experiments and um, numerical simulations of granular materials as well. But the one important thing is that the flow, um, the height fr from the base is constant as you go downstream for the smooth base, so the flow is not accelerating or um, you know, changing its packing fraction much, it's much, it's just one continuous depth of flow. While in the rough base, we see that the flow at the top of the chute is much higher than the flow at the bottom of the chute. So it's kind of compressing or condensing as it flows down. So we get velocity profiles, and um, I'm just checking the time, how far are we? Left. All right, we get velocity profiles, but much more interesting is the, um, the, the force. So we have here an observed picture and a calculated picture. And by using a least square um, minimization algorithm, we can get a perfect match between that. And we can actually get quantitative dynamic data from our um, measurements. So we get forces and stresses from this experiment. So, um, we have an experimental image, we reproduce a synthetic image, we get a contact network, and we coarse grain it to get a certain continuous stress distribution in this flow. And what we find is that um, we have a an, an preferred angle at minus 20 degrees, which is the angle of gravity, but we also have a peak in force change at 90 degrees. So that is actually the force change, if you looked at the, at the video earlier on, the force chains are either orientated with the base or they're orientated with gravity. And that's their two preferred directions in this flow. Um, and we also get um, mean forces um, and look at, the different, um, look at the different stress contributions because we have access to all four stress components, so both the two normal stresses and the two shear stresses. We find that um, the stresses behave fairly hydrostatically um, in both cases, but they have a slightly different um, um, magnitude. Um, so the next step would be, could one do rheology from this? Because that's one approach from this experiment. Can you actually get all the ingredients to do the rheology? Yes, we can. Um, and this is an example where we really have a flowing layer on top of an almost static layer. So this is because we have an extra rough base and we get uh, inertia numbers that we're able to calculate, and um, linear velocity profiles, we can get the entire stress ratio tent, um, matrix with all the, uh, the components. And from that, we can actually uh, probe granular rheology in greater detail. Because of time, I'm gonna skip to the second topic here, because I want to give that some, some, um, some attention as well. But in summary, I think this is the first technique that's able to get both kinetic and dynamic data from a granular dynamic avalanche. Um, the other techniques, as I mentioned, are able to probe, um, some of them are able to look in 3D, 
and get quasi-steady data. Um, some of them are able to get data in 3D if you insert a fluid, but it really like changes the properties. So this is, a, I think, a, a new technique and a new um, application, to bring back my <laughs> title a little bit, that brings the field a bit further. And um, we have two papers in submission on this topic. So to go back to the outline, the last example that I want to give is um, kind of a system perspective. So we talked about particle-particle interaction, and that's very important. But if you think about the big sand dune in the, in the desert, you know, what's the information from the particle that impacts the large-scale motion of a sand dune that's half a kilometer wide? That's, of course, one, one question. So you're really looking at more kind of like, kind of like pattern formation, which underlying physics may be influenced by the particles, but there, there must be like an overarching um, behavior as well. And um, this is an uh, example from one of the experiments in our lab um, on dune migration. So um, in I'll introduce the experiment in a moment. But dunes actually appear in both uh, fluids and just air. So in the desert, one finds dunes. Underwater, um, in, in river estuaries, in float flood basins, you find bed forms as well. My voice is... Uh, the different forms and shapes of these dunes, depending on both the flow rate or the, the wind speed and the sediment supply. Those are the two big controls. So this is an example from um, aqueous dunes. These are transverse ridges where you have sediment kind of climbing on top of each other. This is an ex the same example from the first page where we have a large aeolian dune, massive, which is traveling on hard bedrock, but the dune itself obviously is made from fine sediment. Um, and the point I want to make is that there are different features, different dunes depending on the flow conditions, but there seems to be an overlap between water and air. And if you look more deeply, the particle Reynolds number is very equivalent between these two regimes. So you can deduce um, certain loss from one, uh, for example, an, an aqueous experiment in the lab, and try to um, apply it to the bigger system scale in the, in the um, field. This is another example from Mars, to kind of uh, go back to high rise. Um, these are Barkan dunes that actually move, and you see interactions as well. So there's a, a big dune here, a smaller dune there. A smaller dune catches up, and there's some interaction. And our idea was to look at um, look at this in a very controlled way, because nature is messy. So if you look at satellite images uh, from either Earth or Mars dunes, um, it's just really hard to control parameters and really get to the crux. So um, there are really interesting um, questions, both on the initiation of dunes. So if you start from a, a flat bed, if you have the initial um, kind of kicking off of small ripples that, f that grow and form, the initial um, st linear stability, and then if that kicks off and you have ripples, um, what happens if you have nonlinear pattern coarsening and these li ripples kind of interact and grow into bigger bed forms? And there are a lot of open questions. And today I'll be presenting work that I've done with uh, my postdoc, Paul, um, on interaction potentials. When you already have ripples, or if you already have dunes, how do they merge and collide? Um, but recently I had a, a student uh, starting Carl, who's using the same setup. He's funded by uh, Schlumberger, and Sean Lovett is the um, industrial advisor, and I also got Colm interested in the problem. Um, so they're both involved right now as well. But I'm not covering the work by Carl today, as a kind of disclaimer. So the experimental setup, it's large. Um, it's two meters across, it's half a meter high, and it's an annulus. So it's two concentric cylinders that move as one. So it moves on a turntable. And then on top, we have a pedal assembly that rotates in the other direction. We fill it with water. So we have water, sediment, pedals going one direction, material going the other direction. And um, we can change the, the rotation speed. We can change the amount of sediment. We can change the amount of, of fluid. But um, 
we're using the particles um, uh, up to now we've just used glass bellatini because they're so nicely um, they have a very uniform shape and they're well sift um, and we the, the kind of non-dimensionalist numbers to kind of put it in perspective is that we're in the turbulent regime we have 10,000 Reynolds number about Hundred thousand, sorry. We have a particle Reynolds number of about one thousand. We are uh, below one fruit number, and what we're doing is we have an external camera. We're looking at the experiment. So as the experiment comes by, we're tracking the entire flow regime. But we one individual doing, we only see once every rotation because we have a sta stationary camera. Um, and we've done a little bit of this is actually worked by Carl to to put it in perspective we've done a little bit of piv to get an idea of the flow structure so here in dark you see these pedals coming by but in general we have a, a nice uh, turbulent velocity profile and this is um just general without any significant structure in the area that we're doing experiments in so what you get is that initially you start with a flat bed it of it forms these these terraces that kind of climb on top of each other. So if first you have ripples that form the terraces, and those terraces grow. And as these bed forms grow, they, um, the area between these bed forms is eroded up to a point where you don't have any sediment at all before and after a dune. So you get these individual barken dunes that are disconnected. And you can really look at the bed evolution. So this is zero, two pi, so this is one rotation. This is time, 20 minutes. So you see this flat bed. And then the next rotation, you see the first undulation appearing. And you see the next one. And then slowly the, the ri these ripples grow. You see these individual bed forms appearing. Sometimes they merge. So here we have some, some lines to guide your eye. So at this point, the first gaps appear. So those are the gaps between the dunes. And you can really look at the history back where the dunes came from. Um, so one idea is, of course, to look at the steady state, because you may wonder, well, does it course un unlimitedly? And it doesn't. Um, at a certain point, it locks in. Um, so initially, you have the flatbed instability. The amount of dunes decreases. But at a certain point, you have a stable state. And there's a, a fixed number of dunes that fits in our experiment. That remains there in infinity. There's a little bit of wiggle here. So one could say there's still a lot of... Um, of interaction between bed forms and that's what Carl is currently looking at but um, um, in general it's just a fixed state so what what I'm presenting today is just two examples of kind of like merging and um, ejection of dunes merging and inter interaction of dunes so here we have two dunes coming together they're slightly different speeds they start to interact and they form one dune to go further so two smaller dunes. And the, the trick that they catch up on each other is that the, the, the dune in the back, this one, is slightly smaller. And smaller dunes always travel faster. And therefore, it has an ability to catch up. So it catches up, it forms a bigger dune, and it raises off as one. And then here we have two dunes. The back one is again smaller. It catches up. But as it catches up, it takes a bite out of it. And then the front dune becomes smaller and raises off. And this is representing these pictorials. So you have two dunes. They either form one, or in the second case, in the ejection case, they, uh, the back one takes a bite out of this front one. It becomes bigger, so slower. And the front one is able to raise off. And this is all due to the fact that the migration velocity, the V in this case, is going as one over the height. So smaller dunes are fast. Larger dunes are slow. And this is actually, if you're coming from a fluids perspective, it's counterintuitive to waves, where um, larger waves usually travel faster. So it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, 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 but this is how it works. So we've done some really nice um, cellular automaton model simulations together with uh, two collaborators from IPGB in Paris um, to kind of mimic this these coalescence and ejection behaviors. So here's a movie on the first one. So we have the, the smaller dune that catches up. It kind of catches, there's a plateau here. You see this plateau? But this dune was not able to escape. So now it moves as one. 
let me just run that again because uh, so we have a smaller dune. It catches up. It starts to erode, erode and and integrate the the blue material. This dune tries to get away, but it forms a plateau. It's not able to escape, and it becomes one dune that moves further. That's the let me go back to the slide. That's the coalescence behavior, the merging behavior. In the ejection case, you have two different dunes. This one comes clear, uh, closer. It integrates material, but then if you look at this interface, it drops in height until the point where this one is able to race off and escape. How many minutes? Five. Perfect. That's good. <laughs> I have another five minutes of presentation. This is, by the way, in periodic domain, so therefore you have this one, but it's actually the same dune. So coalescence and ejection is two very different behaviors. And you probably wonder when do you get one and when do you get the other. And this kind of goes back to the fact where I presented one of the grand challenges in the beginning, where if you have a system, do you always get the same outcome, especially in granular materials? Is it deterministic or is there some kind of probability involved? And unfortunately, it's the latter one. So these are three simulations with exactly the same input. So what we know, th this is the specific input, but we have three random seats. So we have two dunes coming together, and here they merge into one. So you have one dune moving further. And color here is the height, and the proxy for the height, as a function of lateral position and time. Time is increasing in this way, by the way. So a little bit counterintuitive. Time is increasing that way, direction is increasing that way. Here we have two dunes, they're interacting, but we have ejection, and actually we have two dunes ejecting, two small dunes ejecting, two individual streaks. And this is the third example, where we have two dunes, and one dune is ejecting. So we have three different <laughs> outcomes for the same experiment, well, numerical experiment. Um, but we, we looked at the probabilistic phase diagram, and very fortunately there's a reason to this madness. Um, we tried different initial downstream areas, and it all comes to one curve. Well, perhaps one outlier, but one curve. This is plotting the ratio of upstream and downstream dunes, and this is whether you get ejection or coalescence. And what you can see is that if the upstream dune is very small uh, compared to the downstream dune, then you always have coalescence. If the upstream dune is very large um, compared to um, the downstream dune, you always have ejection. And then there's this region in between where it's really a probabilistic game. Sometimes you get ejection, sometimes you get coalescence. And this is represented in this phase diagram. So we have downstream area and upstream area. This is the border where we can't have any interaction at all. Because if we're here, the front dune would be the smallest and raise off anyway. This is a transition region. So here we always have ejection, here we have coalescence, and this is kind of a probabilistic um, kind of point where we have a, a sliding uh, scale. We have most of the time coalescence here and most of the time ejection there. But now the last step is to see if we can actually relate this to experiments. So this is a snapshot of our experiment. And this was actually a coalescence event. So first of all, I, I can't give you the full kind of plot of how the dunes evolved, because we just have one snapshot every rotation, unfortunately. But this snapshot, you can see very clearly the plateau. So we have the qualitative same behavior, and we do have um, you know, the same kind of outcome. We have two dunes that come together. And if we actually quantify it and put the experimental points on the graph, we can see experiments are crosses here, so it's ejection in red, coalescence in blue. So we have uh, ejection events here in experiments, coalescence events here. And we see that there's this region where we kind of toggle back and forth in experiments. And that's, I think, due directly to the probabilistic nature of this. So that's the end of um, it's kind of conclusions of that side thing. But that's the end of my presentation. So we looked at two different examples where we had experimental granular materials across scales. So both looking at an example from the particle perspective and one from the system perspective. And I identified three different challenges. The first one is to connect particle to system scale behavior. And how do the two kind of communicate together? And it's still very much an open question and I don't have an answer to it. Um, 
in experiments, we use coarse grading to get that connection, but it's just the single connection at this moment from discrete to continuum. We also looked at repeatability. Um, and we saw the, the um, fingering experiments where one little grain moving there, even though we were extremely careful in our experimental procedure, would give us a completely different outcome. And we saw with the dunes that you know, probability is uh, given both in numerics and um, in experiments. And it really depends on the, um, the feed, what you or the, the, the statistics, basically, what the outcome is. And the last open question that I think is that we, in whatever field of science you're working, you always work with limited data, especially if you're doing experiments. You can only sample so much at such a resolution, at such a kind of like temporal um, time frame. In this case, with granular materials, we're working with opaque materials. So we either need to do, like, insert a fluid such that we can do index matching or, um, you know, look at the quasi-steady uh, process and s s stand it still for a moment to, to probe the state. Um, with our photoelastic materials, we're able to finally get some kinetic data, so we, uh, sorry, dynamic data, so we have access to both data sets. But it's still a limitation that we're in 2D. So I think those are the, the general grand challenges. I don't have an answer to everything, but hopefully this presentation was able to uh, inform you of the, the current state. Thank you. All right, uh, so who, if people have questions, and uh, Tom and Thierry have asked that uh, we should start with questions from students. So, mm. <laughs> so some students should ask some questions as well. <laughs> and as it was Matt, you, can, you had a, no? Okay, so, all right, thanks. There's a question. Yeah. So we have two different radius squares. So my student, Amali, is currently looking at segregation in this setup. Um, however, the experiments I present today are just monodispersed spheres within the 10% variation in size to avoid crystallization. Yeah. But the walls are indeed, you know, kind of confining the flow. But we have 8 millimeters between the walls and the particles are only 6 millimeters. So they may bounce a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but they're not, like, constricted. So they, they flow freely down, as far as we can see. So I have a question on this photoelastic method. I mean, there are fur two further limitations. One is the intrinsic time scale of this photoelastic response, and I wonder on how large it is. And the second one is the elastic behavior itself. I mean, um, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's, of course, not um, a hard uh, granular materials. And uh, for the static cases, uh, what Bob Berenger was doing doesn't matter so much. But here, with these collisions, it does matter. So what is Indeed. the E, the elastic coefficients of this, and what is the intrinsic time scale uh, of the response? I mean, you can't uh, go infinitely fast. And I wonder how, how far off you are from this physical limit of this method. Yeah. So um, I don't have the actual like elasticity models in my head. I can look it up for you. But we have explored the material before we started to put it in this shoot. We explored the material and the response. So we've done two different things. First of all, we looked at the viscoelastic response, and there was a slight kind of rise and then petering off over time. So we have that characterized. And the second thing we did, we arranged an array of particles in a line. We gave it a bump, and we looked at the wave propagation and what kind of, um, kind of uh, velocities were created through this single array of particles, and also what the overlap <laughs> was and the, and the response time. So we have that characterized. For the latter part, um, I know that the the loading and the unloading happens in one one thousandth of a second. So we're, we're sampling at a higher frame rate than that, and therefore we're able to see the loading and the unloading of the particles, and hopefully we're able to, to pick the, the maximum there. But we have thought about it. It's not straightforward. We are able to adjust the viscoelastic properties by, in the, the manufacturing of the particles, we can add slightly more cross-linkers and make them more rigid. But the drawback of that is that the photoelastic response is also lower, so you get lower forces out. So we were trying to look for the optimum. Um, so I, I'll, I'll look up the, the exact numbers. I don't have it in my head. Yes, <coughs> in experience with uh, in experience with rotating drums, 
uh, you see clusters on this kind of avalanche. Do you see the same thing with your photoelastic disk? And if yes, uh, do you see any connection with, with between the force pattern and the clusters? So with clusters, are you referring to um, clusters of particles that move as one? Without yes, any uh, it's a Bonami, Daniel Bonami's work, you know, uh, or dynamical heterogeneities, if you prefer. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen that because we, we characterize the instantaneous velocities and there's usually shear across the entire um, moving bit. So we, we don't see clusters that really move as one unless you're really looking at a quasi steady um, area where we had this really, really rough base. The bottom layer would hardly move at all. And then you would have these locked in like layers of particles. But that's not really what you're referring to, right? So no. We, we didn't see that. Very nice talk. Um, I'm wondering, for the case where you're tracking the evolution of these Barkhand dunes, and you see the merging events, but then eventually you get to, I'll call it like a, a steady state profile, the, the separation distance, or even better yet, the number of dunes that are observed as you go around the circle, I, I, have you thought about how that's influenced by rotation speed, uh, the circumference of the circle, and so on? Yeah, we explored that. Um, it was actually a rather boring result because we would usually, well, a little bit. We would always get to the same amount of dunes, even if we put a much thicker layer of sediment in there. The dunes would just be higher with less space between them. Um, so that was one. Th there was a little bit of variation, though. If we, we always prepare a bed you know, in the same way. And sometimes we would get eight bed forms, sometimes nine bed forms. But because we can't really make the pathway of our experiment twice as long, uh, we can't really explore the... Um, I it's kind of I integer number, right? So the, the most natural number may be 8.4, and then it just toggles back and forth a little bit. But we can't explore that. The, the one thing that I forgot to mention in my presentation, the reason that we chose this, <coughs> this analysis is that we can really look at long-term processes. Because if you look at a rectangular flume, you start on one end, you run out of space. <laughs> However long you're doing, but you can't look at a steady state because you run out of space. And with this analysis, we can really look at that. But it's restricted in the length that we're able to probe. Hi, that was a really, really interesting talk. Um, you probably know all about this, but when you were listing your array of different sensing techniques, I was um, reminded of this concept called smart dust. Hmm. OK, so these are, these are, these are uh, sensor networks of millimeter scale uh, sensor, you know, communicating particles with accelerometers in them. And it just occurred to me for all of these granular type flows, that might be a really interesting technique I'll for... I'll talk with you later. Okay, I, I, I mean, I, don't I know very little there's... about them, but you can Google no, it. If you, could, <laughs> if you could, you know, give me a little bit of a sure. contact name or affiliation, I can figure that out. Yeah, yeah, I it seems like that could this. be a really interesting technique for yeah, some of these flows. Yeah, okay. definitely. I'll explore it. Thank you. So very, very interesting talk, Natalie. I was wondering what controls the thickness of this static layer at the bottom of your cell in, in these, yeah. these protoelastic particles. So it's, it's actually, um, let me go back to the um, a drawing or a photo of the experiment. You oh, I'm going the wrong direction. My apologies. There's a simple answer to this. So the particles have an inherent kinetic and dynamic angle of repose. Oh. There we go. The particles have an inherent uh, angle of repose to them. So this shoot is fixed at 20 degrees. The particles have um, a slightly steeper angle for a certain roughness. So the layer that you get is actually um, kind of tapering off towards, towards the bottom. And I skipped over that because of time. But you get uh, a super stable heap because of the sidewall friction. So you can see it here. So over here we have this static layer where almost nothing is moving. This is the rough base case. So the velocity is almost zero. So this is the, the depth of the static layer here. But uh, as you track it down, it actually decreases. And it's, it's almost zero there. So it's, it's less exciting than you may think. It's just the, the super stable, the, the effect of the side walls that create friction, that create the super stable heap. And therefore you have this rough base forming um, when you have this very rough boundary layer. Does that answer your question? Um, obviously, it would be ideal if we could change our inclination 
but this is a very heavy bit of experiment. It's four and a half, no, four meters high, four meters across. So we bolted it to the wall for safety. Um, and we can't simply just, you know, we could put an insert there. That's the only thing that, that we've been thinking about. We haven't done it yet. But we can't rotate the entire system because it's, it's so well bolted. But it is, and the angle is something that we would love to explore further. Uh, thanks, sure. guys. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.